Um, hello and welcome everyone to our event, Words Matter, about James King of William and San Francisco's Vigilantes of 1856 with Dr. Nancy Taniguchi. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. For those of you who are unfamiliar with mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, the oldest in fact designed to serve the public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Um, Mechanics Institute was two years old when uh, the events that we'll talk about today unfolded. Um, right now, due to the pandemic, all of our activities are still virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area, and you enable us to continue to host uh, events like this one that explore San Francisco's um, history and culture. So our speaker today is uh, Dr. Nancy Taniguchi. Uh, she was born in Washington and raised in Virginia, but has lived all over, including um, Tucson, Mexico City, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Utah, and Central California. She is a history professor emerita from California State University Stanislaus. Um, by chance, she discovered a copy of the minutes of the San Francisco's 1856 Vigilance Committee. Um, and these were lost for over 150 years. And this discovery inspired um, her third book called Dirty Deeds, Land, Violence, and the 1856 San Francisco Vigilance Committee. So the dirty deeds of this group of folks is what she will be talking about today. Um, she and her husband have two kids and two grandchildren and live now in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, let's see. So the way it's going to work is Nancy is going to share her uh, knowledge with us. And afterwards, we will take questions. So please post these in the chat space and I will pose them to Nancy, I hope in, a, in an engaging and conversational style um, and she'll answer them. So uh, thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you all for turning out today. And we look forward to hearing all about uh, James King of William and the Vigilantes. Thank you, Taryn, for that lovely introduction. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here, and I appreciate the sponsorship of the Mechanics Institute. And as you can read, I'm going to be talking about Words Matter, James King of William and San Francisco's 1856 Vigilance Committee. James King of William used words as weapons and was proud of it. In his editorial of April 18th, 1856, he thundered, 1,400 souls left our wharves on steamer day. The women and children, I, native-born California children, too, are eastward bound. Why? Our public men, our representatives, our office holders are of the most notorious scoundrels in the community. Look at the board of supervisors running this county into debt at railroad speed. Look at your mayor, imbecile for any good. Look at your public offices filled not by honest merchants or mechanics, but by gamblers and thieves and shoulder strikers. Ah, yes, steamer day. San Francisco then rocked to the rhythm of steamer day, which came every two weeks as the US mail steamship prepared to sail. Creditors collected debts, residents wrote last minute letters home, travelers packed their bags, and banks crated gold, sending millions of dollars from the California mines every month to their parent bag banks back home. The following day, the steamer sailed down to Central America, where passengers and cargo crossed the isthmus and boarded a sister ship in the Gulf of Mexico. Next stops, Havana, New Orleans, then New York. The whole trip took three to four weeks. And if, for example, 
any dossiers, mail, or agents were headed to Washington, D.C. for discussion and deliberation, their transit took several days longer. This timing would become very important to the vigilantes. Responses returning by the same route took the same amount of time on this, the fastest connection between San Francisco and the states, as Californians called it. James King of William was right about the exodus on that April day, but wrong about the cause. Yes, San Francisco government had a seamy record, but on April 19th, the California state legislature passed the Consolidation Act, which it had been considering for some time, stipulating that on the following July 1st, only the county government would rule the coterminous city and county of San Francisco, limiting the size of the city and county as well. The real cause of the exodus was widespread bank failure, which had hit San Francisco like a hurricane on Friday, February 23rd, 1855, Black Friday. That day, news had arrived on the mail steamer of bank failures in the east. Rumors fled through the town, fueled in part by notices hung on bulletin boards like the one shown here. And I want to point out, here's the bulletin board. And it's right next to the Empire Engine Company, which was organized by David Broderick. You'll hear more about him later. He's the leading Northern Democrat in San Francisco, and this is his entree into politics. They also fought fires. So there were specific places where people looked for notices of what was coming up. Forewarned of this crash, the, some of the California banks had already forwarded bullion to their president parent institutions. California's banks did not retain enough bullion to cover their own needs. In a panic, depositors rushed to withdraw their funds. Seven San Francisco banks closed. Six never reopened, including the bank of James King of William. San Francisco itself remained gutted, plagued by bankruptcies and pockmarked with over 100 vacant commercial buildings. As another banker whose bank survived noted, California is thrown back three years, but the mines are still here. We have a city with its wharves, warehouses, and stores and dwellings, although individuals must be ruined. A word about King's odd name. As a youth, he had added his father's name to his own to stand out from the other James Kings in his native Georgetown, Washington, DC. Coming to California in 1848, he had tried his hand at mining, then opened the bank. Now he was among those seeking a new way to support his wife and six children. Borrowing $250, he decided to open his own newspaper, the Daily Evening Bulletin, to vent his own uncompromising moral judgments on institutions and individuals. In those days, libel and slander could generate a duel, but King had already refused such a contest, although he assured his readers that he went armed and would defend himself if attacked. Others thought he would need to, as he continually criticized not only politicians, but among others, competing newspaper editors. Real estate brokers, including the partner of the man who had loaned him the $250, all Roman Catholics. Here's an example. He blamed the cathedral rector, Father Gallagher, for brutality at the hospital with a connivance of Sisters of Mercy with Jesuit fathers. This unfounded personal attack on a beloved priest horrified local Catholics. One respectable Catholic lady believed that King's know-nothing backing allowed him to write outrageously against men of education and standing in the city, venting his personal spite in a blackguard manner and calling it zeal for the public good. A wealthy Irish merchant recorded in his daily diary that he had met with other Catholic elites who agreed that the only way to deal with King was to write a card or personal ad signed by some of the best men in the congregation denying the charges. 26 of the city's most prominent Catholics published a letter asserting that Father Joseph Gallagher has not now and never had any control of the hospital and blamed King's animosity to him personally or to the denomination of which he and we are members for the malicious editorial. King printed this card and in the same article, harumphed, the cowardly attempt of this committee of 26 to draw us into a controversy with the church is too apparent. Father Gallagher's friends show us that it is their fault 
they will see that we do not shrink from our duty. King also went after the customs house employees, but not the head of the customs house who had given his brother a cushy job. And he attacked James P. Casey. Casey was a scrappy political operative who had also started his own paper, the Weekly Sunday Times. He used it to attack King over his selective customs house critique. And King retaliated. It does not matter how bad a man Casey had been. The fact that Casey has been an inmate of Sing Sing prison in New York is no offense against the laws of this state, nor is the fact of him having stuffed himself through the ballot box as elected to the board of supervisors. Casey, furious about the revelation of his New York prison term, rushed to the bulletin office and the two argued violently. That evening, May 14th, as King left his office, Casey stepped out on Montgomery Street, shouted, defend yourself, and shot King. The wounded editor was carried to a nearby building and Casey was imprisoned in the county jail. King initially improved until doctors inserted a sponge in his side to staunch the bleeding and left it there festering until he died of sepsis six days later. Thus, 165 years ago today, on May 14th, 1856, when King was shot, San Francisco reached a tipping point. It brought on the Second Vigilance Committee, America's largest organization of this kind. The city had long responded thus to its troubles and King had been actively stirring the pot with his all important words. In 1851, he joined the first vigilance committee of some 700 men, ran for the committee's chief of police, receiving only two votes, and was later elected to the executive committee, the name that the elite vigilante leaders had given themselves. The general committee composed of the rank and file lasted some five months and officially disbanded. However, Occasional crimes induced a gathering of followers and the 1851 executives kept meeting for two more years until 1853. They carefully preserved most of their papers, including carefully kept minutes, correspondence, financial records, and members' names and numbers, which had been adopted initially to preserve their secrecy. They wanted to show the world that they were not a treacherous mob, but acted with proper decorum and deliberation. Next, during the horrific drought of the winter of 1853-54, miners who could not wash out their pile descended on San Francisco, lured by the rumor that the Federal Land Commission, then in session, would grant San Francisco's land to settlers and on its many empty lots. Frightened elite claimants confronted them with pistols, knives, and clubs. In June, the elite formalized what they called the People's Organization, mirroring the 1851 committee to act as special police to aid the authorities. When the city hired 48 new policemen to control the squatter threat, they disbanded. But this 1854 violence highlighted another deeper problem. No one owned land in San Francisco. Of course. Lots of people had claims on this land that used to belong to the Ohlone. There were all kinds of ranchos that had claims to the area. And there were some major claimants then all in litigation. The blue line here covers the Santian claim, one of the biggest owned by a consortium at that point in Philadelphia. The brown line is the Limantour claim, which seemed to have the best chance of being approved. The Presidio, of course, claimed its own property. The Pueblo of San Francisco, which allegedly existed, had two different sizes, three leagues and four leagues. And all of this land here is water lots. Water lots, they were part of this crazy quilt of surveys. As one vigilante leader later explained, we purchased all the titles we could get. We bought the city's title and the state's title, and then somebody fought us, and we finally compromised for $2,500, which was as good a title as any place in the city, which was not saying much. These water lots, in fact, were 
up to 25 feet of water under low tide, and all of them were in litigation. Now, if you look at how the city had increased, this is the water lots. And the Vigilance Committee's so-called fort, which I'll mention briefly, was here. Oops, right here on one of the water lots. Because in from 1850 to 1856, all this land had been filled in. And by the way, this was the most valuable land on the west coast of North America because of all the shipping. While King lay dying, the city's elite reconstituted the Vigilance Committee. The executives united with their friends and admitted the rank and file if each were endorsed by two known committee members. On the first day, they enrolled over a thousand vigilantes, a number that would rise to almost 6,000 later. Judging by their numbers, the largest I could find was number 5,905. The 30 or so executives organized men in division, into divisions of 100 each, each of which elected a captain, vice captain, and a third man to join them as delegates in later meetings designed to confirm executive decisions. That was it, confirm them. All were known only by their numbers, determined to preserve their secrecy. After all, words could make them vulnerable. After they chose their fort, a large remodeled warehouse, it was later fortified by sand-filled gunny bags, therefore generally known as Fort Gunny Bags. It was on Sacramento Street between Front and Davis. The executives sent each division to its own armory, that is one of San Francisco's many deserted buildings, and then resolved first to grant full power to the executive committee. Second, to withdraw all their advertising from their previously favored newspaper, the Herald. Since most of the executives were merchant auctioneers, they bought up whole shiploads of tea, nails, calico, furniture, cigars, accordions, and a host of other products for a state that produced little other than gold. Running their ads was a lucrative business. Then as now, money talked. They particularly targeted the Herald, edited by Catholic lawyer and journalist John Nugent, because he had immediately editorialized against a new vigilance committee. His paper instantly lost 212 subscribers and most of the merchant's advertisements. When an executive suggested that Nugent should be called in to defend himself, a dozen voices spoke up and said that if the editorial was bad enough, the Herald had always been on the wrong side. Furthermore, Rowdy seized all the copies of the Herald they could find, piled them up on Front Street and burned them. With one exception, the rest of San Francisco's 12 newspapers all quickly fell into line. The Evening Bulletin willingly published the documents generated by Casey's New York trial and incarceration. The Chronicle, which had initially cautioned against hasty action and urged due process of law rather than mob rule, recanted when its subscribers and advertisers turned to the Daily Alta California, where the Herald's former advertisers also appeared. Therefore, the Alta became the premier journal in the city. Words moved around. Other editors took note and leapt to support the new Vigilance Committee. Only the Sun, after wavering a day or two, also condemned the vigilantes. To its own detriment, some days it published whole or half blank columns under regular advertising heads, making light of its own loss of business. Third and finally, the executives agreed to demand the removal of Casey and gambler Charles Cora from the county jail. Give them a fair trial before our members and mete out such punishments as justice may require. That they did. Cora had previously tri been tried for shooting U.S. Marshal William Richardson. He claimed self-defense but the unequal social status of the two men favored Richardson. Not only was Cora a gambler, but he lived openly without benefit of marriage with the lovely Madame Belle Cora, previously Arabella Ryan. She had hired one of San Francisco's top lawyers to defend her partner. The result had been a hung jury 
And now Cora sat in jail awaiting a second trial. When King died, he became a martyr. Thousands of citizens turned out for his May 22nd funeral. Meanwhile, the vigilantes had been busy building a drop on the top of their fort. As the church bell rang, marking the end of King's funeral, here he is, oops, in his casket. His doctors are here ahead of him. The masons with their badges, he was a mason. There are all of these different groups. At the end, there were seven African-Americans with their lodge badges, badges, all parading through San Francisco streets. As the church bell rang, marking the end of King's funeral service, a line of vigilantes yelled, cut, and the drop fell, flinging Casey and Cora into eternity. Initially, decorum was preserved until this large winding parade approached the top of a hill overlooking the vigilante's fort. Chaos ensued. According to one participant, thousands initially quitted the funeral pageant like an ocean wave propelled by the dread fury of the elements came these mighty masses of human beings rushing, struggling and clamoring to the scaffold. At least one vigilante then resigned stating his objectives had been met. But the executives were far from finished. On June 6th, they published their proclamation outlining their alleged reforming goals. And here are the executives in committee. You notice the rifles behind them with bayonets fixed. They carried sidearms as well, and they are performing their duties in an organized manner. Their proclamation highlighted organized despotism, tyranny and misrule, and unscrupulous leaders. So they promised to purge the city by calmly and dispassionately weighing the evidences before them and decreeing the death of some and banishment of others. They asserted that the great majority of inhabitants of the county endorse our acts, so important since all law emanates from the people which the vigilantes embodied, embodied, pledging our lives, fortunes, and our sacred honor to the cause. Citizens believing this statement began peppering the committee with letters of complaint, of bribes, incest, bad roads, an abortionist, election fraud, and so on, all of which were ignored by the executives. They began drawing up their own blacklist. They heavily targeted adherents of David Broderick, the leader of San Francisco's Northern Democrats and men involved in land deals as he was. They arrested, they called it, or actually kidnapped, men who didn't know they were wanted, nor for what, held secret trials in which the prosecutor, defender, judge, and jury were all vigilantes, found all their victims to be guilty and arranged for punishment. The first six convicted after Casey and Cora who obviously were executed, were deported on May 27th, but a long list of others cycled through the rooms through June, July, and August. At the same time, vigilante opposition was organized under the Law and Order Party, but they could initially round up only 54 men, including a one-armed judge, all publicly known. As tensions heightened, attempts at diplomacy fell through. Both sides continued recruiting men, then arming their followers. Vigilante divisions paraded through the streets, often to the accompaniment of their own bands. While the unemployed were thus kept busy, business in San Francisco was at a standstill. Vigilante plans to disband, first on June 18th, then on July 4th, then in August, were continually frustrated by unexpected conflicts and confrontations. There were many. For example, when the Law and Order Party bought weapons to ship down to the city on the schooner Julia, informants alerted the vigilantes. Vigilantes, and by the way, they should say captured state arms and militiamen. Uh, vigilantes intercepted the Julia on June 21st, boarded the ship at night, brandishing guns and cutlasses. Because this attack took place on the bay, the vigilantes involved were accused of the federal crime of piracy, the first time the committee 
had actively confronted federal law, increasing executive anxiety. And let me point out that many of, in fact, virtually all of the illustrations I have are contemporary. And as you've already learned, the newspapers were largely pro-vigilante. And so what you see here is men in top hats are the vigilantes boarding the schooner Julia. And the top hat was a, was a significant symbol of elite, the vigilantes are the, the elite. And there on the ship are guys that don't have top hats. Armed committee members on shore attacked all the law and order armories, which surrendered, completely outnumbered. Soon, all arms in the city were in the hands of the vigilantes, except those on ships in the harbor. Tensions rose throughout the city during the summer while the sequestered executives quietly pursued their own political goals. Well, first, they followed the bulkhead bill under consideration by the city government, the latest manifestation of Broderick's recurring attempt to control the city's waterfront. As I said, the most valuable land on the west coast of North America. Whomever built this bulkhead structure would control the land around it. Merchant auctioneer Thomas J. L. Smiley privately reported to his fellow executives that the bill was unlikely to pass, but he would continue to monitor its fate. They all realized that if the bill could be stalled until July 1st, it would die with the Common Council itself, because on that day, only county officials would remain, thanks to the Consolidation Act. Second, the executives prepared for outright rule of San Francisco. After July 1st, if the county officials could be ousted, the Vigilance Committee would become the only power in the city. President Coleman moved in the minutes that an executive sub subcommittee be formed to inquire into and report upon those county officers who should be invited to resign. The next day he sought to clarify who and what power would fill those vacancies until the next election. His main concern was to determine if the detested Democratic committee Broderick's adherents could lawfully act as a board of supervisors until the election in November. Regardless of legal procedures, if Broderick's men were gone, they could not rule. Consequently, the executive sent two men to find evidence against selected targets. Executive Charles Gillespie, a searcher of records or private investigator, went to investigate the records of the governor and other county officials, but found nothing useful. San Francisco policeman John Durkee, now a vigilante with a secret number, went to abstract the records of the court. Specifically disregarding Chinese and Mexicans, Durkee searched the records back to 1853 for the names of notorious characters with a Broderick taint. One active Democrat discharged after a single time for fighting in 1855 made their blacklist. Another man who had been arrested eight times beginning in January of 1853 for assault, battery, disorderly conduct, and receiving stolen property had not been politically active and was ignored. Adding several Broderick operatives to the blacklist, the executives themselves took responsibility for maintaining, for obtaining damning testimonies and turned to their delegates for approval to convict and deport everyone they had blacklisted. As executive James Dowes later sneered, that sort was not entitled to a trial. As after the city government quietly disappeared on July 1st, thanks to the Consolidation Act, the executives tried hard to get absolute control of San Francisco. At their July 12th mass meeting, as planned, they invited the county officers to resign. Only the superintendent of schools agreed to quit but only if all the others resigned too. They did not. The executives also briefly detained their main nemesis in San Francisco, David Broderick, but he left San Francisco to canvass supporters in other counties. He later won election to the US Senate in the state legislature, the way senators were elected in those days, partly on the strength of his opposition to the committee. Meanwhile, <clears throat> secretly pursuing land titles, 
On July 13th, the vigilantes arrested Alfred Green, who had loudly proclaimed his possession of the Pueblo Papers, which would, if authenticated, settle title claims on behalf of the city. In other words, if a Mexican Pueblo had indeed existed at the site of San Francisco, grants made by the city would predate any other claims and justify other subsequent city grants. But Green had committed no crime. Eventually, after imprisoning Green for almost a month from July 13th to August 11th, the executives paid him $12,500, half of what they had promised him, to obtain the Pueblo papers, and then they let him go. They began trying to confirm the paper's authenticity based largely on where they had gotten their own claims. Expenses mounted. Finally, on August 18th, the vigilantes staged their final parade. But 10 days after this, bad news arrived. The New York Times coming on the mail steamship reported the complaints of a deportee stuck in New Orleans after deportation by the committee. This article of July 31st arrived in San Francisco only on August 28th. In the East, other publications damned San Francisco's vigilantes. In September, the Presbyterian arrived, a paper published by the church in Philadelphia, a paper which enjoyed national circulation. The distinguished pastor of San Francisco's Calvary Church had that Dr. William Scott had just published his strongly worded condemnation of the vigilantes, believing that the people had settled down calmly to reflect and reason. He was wrong and was hung in effigy that Sunday in front of his own church. Many local citizens were disgusted by this anonymous action. News also arrived that the federal government was considering sending in the army authorized by an army appropriations bill that had just passed Congress. By the way, that never happened. Despite August's grand finale, it remained clear throughout the fall that the committee's troubles were not over. After the committee's final parade, President William Tell Coleman had resigned and returned to his New York office, where he ran straight into one of the many unintended consequences of San Francisco's Vigilance Committee. One of the recent deportees, James Roby or Rumid Maloney, sued him in the courts of New York for his actions back in San Francisco. Kidnapping, depriving him of his home, property, monies to him, livelihood, and his good name. Several other executives arriving back east met the same fate from a host of deportees from San Francisco. Again, expenses mounted. Eastern newspapers carried tales of the litigation, which dribbled into San Francisco a month later. To raise money to counteract all the lawsuits and fund continuing operations, the Vigilance Committee started printing and selling certificates to their members. Obviously, words not only matter, sometimes they make an impressive display and make money. Now this, as you can probably see, depending on the size of your screen, is the certificate of Gordon Blake, number 5337 of the First Division Infantry. It's signed by Thomas J. L. Smiley as President, Isaac Bloxham Jr. as Secretary, William Meyer as Treasurer, and Charles Doan as Grand Marshal because Coleman had already left, so he couldn't sign it. And it was designed by Charles Nall, a famous California artist who was also a vigilante. The executives also tried to corral more contributions which had previously supported them. They went around town with little brown leather covered books and people would pledge so much money and then the vigilantes would come around and collect. But a lot of San Franciscans tired of the conflict began turning their interest to other issues. It's a presidential election year. This is part of the um, political propaganda, if you will, of John C. Fremont. And you can see the free states in red, the slave states in gray, and the states up for grabs in green. The whole country was starting to split apart. Giving the necessity of paying their debts, fighting lawsuits, and enforcing strict penalties against returning deportees, among other matters, the executives had to keep meeting. 
They dismissed the general committee and set fewer executive meeting days, but for years they could not quit. They created the People's Party, a label everyone recognized as pro-vigilante. Its candidates for city office almost always won. The executives went on meetings sporadically. The last entry in their minutes is dated November 3rd, 1859. By then, only 10 executives attended half the original quorum to wind up business. After that, words about the vigilantes had to be left to historians, most of whom have been hamstrung by a lack of records. Unlike the 1851 committee, the second committee of 1856 has never published any of their papers. This gap in vigilante history was filled by two 19th century writers, Hubert Howe Bancroft and Theodore Henry Hattel. In 1871-75, Bancroft received the papers of the 1851 committee and saved them for his library. They were later published. In 1875, Bancroft began interviewing the 1856 executives and learned that their papers were unavailable. At first, he could get nothing from what he called these hard-headed, cold-blooded Yankees. One of them, when spoken to, drew his finger across his throat significantly, saying that that would be to pay if I told all. Bancroft quickly learned that the executives did not want to talk about it, to think about it. It was a horrid nightmare in their memory and they would rather their children should never know anything about it. As 1856 executive Alfred Tubbs explained in his 1887 interview, when the question of giving the committee papers to Mr. Bancroft first came up, a lawsuit was pending in New York brought by some man against Mr. Coleman as an outcome of those times, and he did not care to have these things come out. I voted in favor of delivering them to Mr. Bancroft, but the majority did not because words could be tremendously damaging. More lawsuits, not only in New York, but in three California jurisdictions, ensured that the 1856 record stayed hidden. Bancroft was briefly allowed to borrow the minutes, and rushed through the writing of volume two of Popular Tribunals, volume one was about the earlier committee, making no citations. In a sample passage, he gushed, during all that wild tumultuous time, the executives sat in their chamber and directed every movement, invisible, omnipotent, and omniscient, their powers and intelligence bordered on that of the deity. Before its publication, he sent this manuscript to President William Tell Coleman for his approval then dedicated the volume to William T. Coleman, chief of the greatest popular tribunal the world has ever witnessed. It is the only one of Bancroft's works with a dedication of any kind. He may have been thinking about the possibility of selling 6,000 of these books to the former vigilantes. At any rate, in the East, reviewers panned popular tribunals too. The New York Times complained the firm grasp of his subject, characteristic of the able historian, is in his work, conspicuous by its absence. Theodore Hattel took longer, but did better. Knowing, as Bancroft had, that the vigilantes protected their papers with their lives, he got authorization to carry a gun. He's a lawyer. This is the first time he did that. He published the first two volumes of his massive four-volume history of California in 1885, the last two in 1897, note, 30 years after the Second Vigilance Committee. Volume three included some 200 pages out of 980 on the 1856 committee, while volume four contained about 100 pages more of political events, some related to the Vigilance Committee, a fact carefully disguised by their placement. Just as biased as Bancroft, Hittell concluded almost 3,500 pages of California history with praise for the genuine Californian character of men who face danger with intrepidity, who experience great shifts in fortune with equanimity and possess worth and strength and patience and recognize their own rights and insist on and maintain them. The first indicator of this extraordinary character was the Vigilance Committees and particularly that most remarkable and significant one that may be and generally is called the great one of 1856. Still, 
To demonstrate his professional use of the historical method, Hittel cited his sources, including the minutes. To do so precisely, Hittel copied them. Hittel's copy of the minutes has reposed in the Sutro Library since 1918 and has been available to researchers since 1956. But no one had consulted it until I found it by chance in 2006. Other historians working without this inside view had to rely on other documents, contemporary newspapers, Bancroft's interviews with participants, all of them pro-vigilante, um, lots of correspondence, lots of other materials, such as the 86 page autobiography that Alfred Green, advocate of the Pueblo Papers had given to Bancroft, but he was anti-vigilante and Bancroft completely ignored Green's work. Given the discovery of the minutes, I had to write this book. It's in hardbound, audible, Kindle, and tells a great deal more about the 1856 committee than I could describe here. We now know much more about America's largest vigilance committee, larger than any other of its kind. Its formation was sparked in part by the words and the death of James King of William. I suspect he would be pleased with that. Thank you for your attention. And now I think Taryn is going to arrange for questions. Hi, yeah, thank you for that. I um, was just trying to put a link to your book in the chat space. Um, and I do wanna recommend that those of you interested in San Francisco history, read this book. I've read it twice um, just because I needed to. There's so much information that I needed to absorb. Um, it's available at uh, the Mechanics Institute. And of course it's on Amazon, but I encourage you to buy locally. Um, we like here at Mechanics Institute to uh, buy materials from Alexander Book Company because they're right across market from us. But um, your local uh, bookstore like Green Apple or City Lights, um, they can order it for you. If they don't have it on their shelves, they should be able to get it to you within a couple of days. Um, now, if you have any questions for Nancy, please post them in the chat space. I see that there's been a lot of chatter about the uh, Tolland murals um, that show James King of Williams' death. I will email this to all of you, um, a transcript of the chat so that you can follow the links through when you have more time. Meanwhile, does anyone have any questions? Please post them in the chat space and we can ask Nancy. Uh, Carol mentions that we can order the book directly from Nancy's publisher and that it will be cheaper than buying through Amazon. True. And that is the University of Oklahoma Press. Okay, I'll put that also in the chat space. Um, Susanna has a question. She wanted you to clarify how the minutes ended up in the library. After Theodore Hittel died, his heirs deposited them in the library in 1918, but they restricted them for an unspecified length of time. And in 1956, the librarian of the Sutro went to the remaining family and said, you know, it's been a long time, folks. It's been a hundred years. Can we release Hittel's works, uh, all of his papers for study? In fact, he didn't know the minutes were there, I'm sure, because he was a very, very active historian. I'm sure he would have published himself. But anyway, uh, Hittel's papers were freed uh, for research as of 1956. And yeah, it's an interesting question. Why are they at the Sutro and not at the Bancroft? Because traditionally, California materials all went to the Bancroft. But of course, Hittel and Bancroft, the individuals were rivals. And I suspect, I just speculate here that the Hittel family wanted to deposit the records someplace other than with Hubert Hale Bancroft or his library. And that just makes the whole research process so much more interesting. And complicated. <laughs> <laughs> requiring you to look all over the place for 
for records, but that's fine. <laughs> it happens. Uh, let's see. Um, Uh, there's a question that came in and it appears to come from you, Nancy, but that can't be. Yeah. Um, what kept people from claiming more land and water further out to sea if that area was so valuable? Nothing, nothing. They just kept filing claims. I suppose eventually the water gets too deep to be viable because one of the things that happened is one of the earliest claimants built his house on stilts in the water he'd been shipwrecked in the South Pacific somewhere and had seen that kind of construction. And he was able to use his lighters, his barges, to go out to incoming ships and get their goods before anybody else. And then people went, oh, this is a really good idea. But um, not everybody wanted to conduct business that way. But, but there was nothing much to stop them. Nothing much to stop anybody because everything was in litigation. It's kind of hard for us to understand how shallow the bay was. I mean, I've read, or people have told me that the bay was quite shallow up to like a quarter mile out. And so you could just walk walk around in the bay and not have it reach uh, your shoulders until you were, you were quite far out. So it's, you know, it's to us now that seems crazy, but, um, but it was quite a bit more shallow than, than we're used to today. Well, and that's because the reason why it seems crazy today is San Francisco was a bunch of sand hills and everybody was going around town grading and dumping all the sand into the bay. And so they filled up all that shallow part, obviously. Susanna has another question. She says, how did you come across these, um, let me re rephrase this. Why weren't the minutes why had no, no one ever seen them before? And Good. also, um, where is the Sutro Library? Okay, both good questions. Let me answer the second one first. The Sutro Library is now at San Francisco State University. Um, but why had nobody seen them? I don't think, well, first of all, people didn't know they were there. Secondly, uh, normally you don't have California materials at the Sutro, it's from every other state except California. And so people doing this kind of research wouldn't look there. And the only reason I found them is I was looking for a different manuscript that Hittel had written about William Walker's invasion of Nicaragua. And so when I went to the Sutro, I asked, could I please see Hittel's papers? They brought me a pile. In the very first pile were the minutes. And I'd been teaching California history at that point for some 20 years, and I knew what I was looking at. I just thought, oh, oh my gosh, who's seen them, who's used them? And I proceeded to check everything that was published that I could get my hands on, and only Hittel cites them. That is every historian's dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, looks like Darcy has a question. Um, did the vigilantes activities here in San Francisco um, encourage similar groups in other parts of the country or the state? Yes, they did. I can't speak definitively about other parts of the country, but I know, for example, um, Collis Huntington, who later becomes one of the big four that builds the railroad across the United States, writes to the Vigilance Committee from Sacramento saying, hey, we're thinking of starting a committee up here, send us your constitution and bylaws and we can use it. And there were others formed in, in California, but mostly not because the mining camps had their own ways of handling things. And uh, Sacramento did do one. And there was one in Contra Costa County, I forget exactly where, but they were copies of the San Francisco Vigilance Committee, at least to some degree. Um, Chloe has a question. Is there a story as to why Casey and Cora are buried at Mission Dolores? Not, there probably is. Um, they were both Catholics for starters. Um, Casey was Irish, Cora was Italian, and that would be where you 
would, would bury people who, and they'd been given the last rites. That was very important. They were given the last rites. So they were eligible for burial at the mission. And in order for Cora to be given the last rites, he had to marry his paramour. And so while he's in jail at the, the so-called Fort Gunnybags, the priest is brought in in front of a couple of executives, he and Bell get married, and then he is given absolution, and then he is given last rites, and, and Casey was also given last rites so that they could be buried in sacred ground. And their graves are um, still there. They are, they Walk are. On. And in yeah. fact, Bell, Bell Cora is buried next to Charles Cora. She died in 1864. She didn't long survive him. And Casey's monument there has a broken ladder because he also was the head of an, one of these fire engine companies that were both political and firefighting. And the broken ladder signifies that his death was, shall we say, not natural. So yeah, they're there, or what's left of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not to laugh, but but their yeah. graves their graves are beautiful, and if you haven't been to Mission Dolores's cemetery, you should go there just because it's full of historical um, people of historical import. Yes, that's very true. Uh, Carol has a comment. She mentions that uh, most illustrations of these events were drawn by and for news periodicals that existed hundreds of miles away and that often they were drawn from imagination and description and not necessarily from firsthand observation. Jenny, Some of that's true. Um, several of them I showed you like the mass meeting were produced right there in San Francisco, um, designed to promote the popularity of the Vigilance Committee. And another important thing to know is that all 12 newspapers did not do this, but some four or five every two weeks created what was called a steamer edition, where they um, took the most important news of the last two weeks for and printed it up to disseminate in what they called the states. And that's where several of these illustrations were published. It's really kind of fascinating and so modern how the Vigilance Committee actively tried to um, to channel their story their way um, and to control the media. And they were very effective at doing that. I mean, but if you read the Herald, which is the only one that really thoughtfully opposes and the sun is too, too weak, doesn't have the backing, doesn't have the talent of John Nugent. It's, it's an interesting, very interesting contrast between that and say the evening bulletin. Which was, which was the Fox News of the vigilantes, the evening bulletin was. Very, well, but all newspapers in those days tended to be biased. They were expected to be politically active on one side or another. So that's mm -hmm. not unusual. Mm -hmm. And sensationalistic. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about how uh, James King of Williams' death perhaps affects I don't want to say media today, but what do you think the effect of his death was on the media? Well, one of the things I really looked into is to what really caused the beginning of the 1856 Vigilance Committee, and it is the shooting of James King of William. And, and some of the papers immediately, you know, assume he's dead, which he wasn't for six days. I don't think most people today even remember who he was, but the obviously vigilanteism has not gone away. And that's one of the reasons why I think this study is very, very relevant for today. And I think more people should know who he was. So he was sort of a martyr for a cause that might've happened anyway. Might've happened. It might. It's very interesting to think what else might have barked this vigilance committee because it was just, perfect storm waiting to happen. And one of the interesting things is, is after his death, there's a song that's composed. He died at his post doing duty. I mean, that's the name of the song. So they, there's all kinds of recognition at the time, but really 
San Francisco was just waiting for some kind of trigger. And James King of William had actively stirred the pot. He was much more critical than anybody else of what he saw as the wrongdoing. And he really didn't care if he had the facts or not. There were times that he was, you know, corrected and he said, well, it's okay. I'm, you know, the, the essence of what I said is correct, even if the facts were wrong. That's, that's how he approached it. Honestly, that's how he approached it. Now, did he have, did James King of William have anything to do with this land scheme? Not that I know of, no. He, he, I mean, his failure was in banking. You, California's constitution originally prevented public banks. So the only banks were private banks, the bank of James King of William, Lucas Turner and company, et cetera. Wells Fargo, which was of course an, a transit agency, but they had a bank as we know. And um, after his bank failed, people offered him money to reconstitute it, but he didn't want to take their money. He was too proud to want to depend on somebody else. Now he did eventually, well, he did go to work for another bank and then that didn't work out. And he went through a, a, a difficult time, but then finally did borrow the $250 to start the newspaper because when he was going through that difficult time, he was criticizing a number of other banks and people liked the way he wrote. You know, criticism sells, anger sells. And uh, they said, you should, you should write a paper because also in those days, editors weren't just editors, they frequently wrote a lot of their own paper. Right. Right, it's interesting how he just became sort of a, a white knight figure. It's very interesting. It's very interesting. And by the way, when the vigilantes were taking up money for their committee, they were also taking up money for his widow and orphans, as they called it, his wife and children. And they got somewhere around between twenty-five and thirty-five thousand dollars, which in those days was a lot of money for the yeah. the widow and orphans of James King of William. I'm sure that would have been in the millions of dollars today. That's correct. Wow. Um, Darcy has one more question. While you've touched on this, can you elaborate on if there are parallels that you see between the media back then and the media today? <laughs> Absolutely, I can see it. Um, we have the same kind of bifurcation, I think, in the media today where certain newspapers and television stations today are very much on one political side and other stations and newspapers are on the other political side. And they're obviously helped promote vigilanteism and the attack on the Capitol uh, on January 6th of this year. So there's a lot of words being thrown around that are really stimulating people to violence. And that is, I think, the main parallel today. And I, I, I hope we will not see more of that, but I don't know that for sure. I, I work in the past, not in the future. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Uh, you've provided a lot of food for thought here. And, um, and again, I want to encourage people to read the book because it just provides you with, uh, provided me with context for the way San Francisco is today. Um, yeah, for those of you that hung on for the last bitter end, I have a bonus slide. Oh. <laughs> that's, Very far. The, that's the guy who founded the library that preserved the minutes that I found that prompted me to write my third book, which is the one we're talking about today. So he's kind of my hero, BFF. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks great for being what 150 years old yeah he's 70 years old <laughs> even a lot better than i am <laughs> <laughs> thank you taryn thank you to the mechanics institute and to all of you for coming you're very welcome uh this has been a delight and i hope you all have a wonderful weekend um i will be sending you an email with the uh pertinent links that we mentioned in the chat and also a link to the video. So if you want to uh, dip into that on the weekend, I hope to have it up and ready tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much and have a great weekend yourself, Nancy. Thanks, Taryn, you too. <laughs> All right, bye everyone. Bye.